they did a good job this morning. Um, thank you, Stacy, for that song. Just remember, uh, we can do all things through Christ. Um, <clears throat> it's an amazing relationship that we have. Um, we're going to go straight into the sermon this morning. Uh, we're, and she's going to be my backup singer. Um, so <laughs> there we go. Um, she said, give me a second. Just give me a second. She, she wants to uh, get off the stage. She doesn't want to be up here the whole time with me. I don't, it, it hurts a little bit, but I'll get over it. <clears throat> um, I, I do want to go straight into the message this morning because, uh, for one, uh, Matt, thank you. I gave him like a novel to announce today. And every, every time uh, I thought I was done, I'd leave and then somebody would remind me of something. I'd come back and say, you still got your pen? You know, and he'd just add things to that list. So we're going to go right into the message this morning. Um, if you will, take, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 22 with me. Um, this morning I want to uh, share a story with you that shows the good, the bad, and the ugly of life scenarios and how God's love is always woven through it. Um, every one of us have scenarios in our life. Uh, the Holcomb family, what you guys are going through right now, uh, we went out and saw uh, Haven. One pound, seven ounces. Such a small little baby. And um, uh, the, the anxiety that puts on you, nobody can do anything. You know, it's just, it is what it is. You just have to pray and let God uh, do what God's going to do because there's nothing you can do to change the scenario. But a lot of times we carry, um, we carry the weight of scenarios in our life. And I want to show how God's love is always woven through these scenarios. Jehoshaphat was a good king in Judah. Jehoram, his son, married the daughter of Jezebel and Ahab. Jezebel and Ahab, those are names that we're familiar with. Um, there's not a whole lot of kids out there named Jezebel and Ahab um, because they have kind of a negative reputation. Um, Jezebel was an evil queen and Ahab was an evil king. Um, Jehoram married their daughter. Her name was Athaliah. Jehoram knew what was right because he was raised by Jehoshaphat, his father. He knew what was right to do. But he ends up marrying Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. Jehoshaphat loved the Lord and only wanted to see good for God's people. Lock that thought in right there. He only wanted to see his family line serve God, love God, and he wanted to see God bless his people through his family line. Jehoshaphat was a good man. He was a good king. All he wanted was God to be glorified through his life and the life of his children. But his son ends up marrying Athaliah. One thing that you would that you would have thought he wanted to see, he got to miss out on. Je when Jehoshaphat died, Jehoram his son takes the throne. But he missed out on the one thing he wanted to see. He wanted to see his, God, his kids glorify God. And he didn't get to see it. That's all he wanted. God to be glorified through my children. And he didn't, he missed it. When he died, his son takes the throne. Jehoram brought a disease into Judah when he married the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. She was wicked. Athaliah is one queen that we don't hear a whole lot about, but she makes Jezebel look like the pastor's wife. Athaliah was Whoa. cruel. No, no, I meant that in a good way. The Tammy's like, Jezebel looks like the pastor's wife? No. I'll talk to you about it after service, Tammy. <laughs> Jezebel looks good compared to Athaliah. Um, Athaliah, um, she, she takes the level of evil up from what her parents did. Ahab and Jezebel were so cruel and they were so, they followed satanic rituals and everything else. And that looks good compared to what Athaliah turns out to be. This was not the legacy Jehoshaphat wanted to leave behind. To this day, Ahab and Jezebel are known for their wickedness. They defied God and served satanic influence. They raised their daughter to do the same. But Athaliah was the new and improved form of wickedness. She's taking it up a notch. Jezebel had God's prophets slaughtered. She worshiped Baal and despised God's promises. But she did one more thing before she died. She gave birth to Jezebel 2.0. She gave birth to Athaliah, and that took the evil farther than she could have ever done herself. Instead of following in the ways of his father, Jehoshaphat, 
Jehoram followed the influence of Athaliah. Jehoram followed Athaliah's lead so much that God tells Jehoram that because of his wicked heart, he would die of a disease that would call, cause his intestines to fall out. Second Chronicles 21, just turn back a page here. I want to show you um, the final statements about Jehoram's life here. Second Chronicles 20, uh, 21 in verse 19, it says, Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of the, his sickness, and he died in severe pain. And his people uh, made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. That's the final chapter of Jehoram's life right there. It says that when he died, he died to no one's sorrow. No one missed this guy. When he died, they were just glad he was gone. And then it says that they buried him in the city of David, but they didn't honor him as a king and bury him in the tomb of the kings. They dishonored him even in his burial. Jehoram's life was a story of failure. That's not what Jehoshaphat, his father, wanted. But that's what, that's what his story is. This is not the legacy his dad wanted. He wanted an offspring to be good. He wanted all of his offspring to be good and godly leaders, and he didn't get that. His son married Athaliah. Years before he died, Jehoram and Athaliah had a son, and his name was Ahaziah. This is Jehoshaphat's grandson. Okay, try to follow the family line here as I'm throwing. There's a lot of names in this sermon today, and just follow with me. So Jehoram has a son. His name is Ahaziah. He did not stay on the scene long, but let's look at his story. This is in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. If you look over to our text this morning, here's the story of Ahaziah. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem, in verse 1, Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place. For the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father to, do, uh, to his destruction. Athaliah raises her son to follow in her footsteps, and he does it. So here you go, Jehoshaphat. Here's another. We go farther down the line, and here's another failure story for you. His decisions take him down the path that ends up killing him. And Ahaziah ends up dying in battle, not doing anything for God, not following in the path that Jehoshaphat wanted for his family. So now you're looking at his grandson and you're still not seeing any hope. So far, the story just seems to get worse. But up until now, it's not so bad. This is where our story takes an ugly turn. When Athaliah's husband Jehoram was alive, she had the power as queen. She was in power. When he died, she lost her position in power, and it went to her son Amaziah instead. That's where, now she's not queen anymore. Her son is now on the throne. Ahaziah, sorry about that. So he's in charge. She doesn't have any power anymore. Then she hears that Ahaziah has been killed, and she does the unimaginable. This is where our story, this is where the negative starts happening in our story. Not all the stuff I've told you up till now. This is where it gets bad. Second Chronicles 22.10, look at the next verse here. It says, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Athaliah went on a personal crusade to kill her own grandchildren. Jezebel looks good compared to this lady. Athaliah decides, I'm going to kill all my grandchildren. And by the way, these are young kids. They're not, they haven't grown yet. They're just kids. And Athaliah goes through and she decides to kill her own grandchildren. If Amaziah had no heirs, then the power goes back to her. So she wipes out her own grandkids. 
that's an evil that it's hard to it's hard to even wrap your mind around that. We look at children and we like how how in the world could anybody do this? This is where her heart was. She destroys her own grandchildren. But what about Jehoshaphat? He was a good king. All he wanted was for God to be dominant in the life of his children. What about where's the blessing? Where's the good? That's all he wanted, and that's a good desire, is to have your children glorify God. What about his story? I want everybody to listen close to this next statement. Don't miss this. No matter how difficult things seem to be, God will never let the story end on a negative note for those who delight in him. It will never happen. No matter how difficult things seem to be, God will never, ever let the story end on a negative note for those who delight in Him. Jehoshaphat's story, it's not over. Even in the darkest days, God cannot be removed, as we talked about last week. He's not going to be removed. Athaliah is now going through all of Judah, slaughtering her own grandchildren. Satan loves to make a counter move every time God makes a move. But God always has another move. And that's, that's what's encouraging. God always has another move. Satan will not be the last word. It will not happen. Every time Satan counteracts, God comes back and he has his next move. It's going to happen every time. This is where I would love to have been able to go back in time and tell Jehoshaphat something incredible. I would love to be able to go back in time until before Jehoshaphat died. And I want to tell him, your son Jehoram is going to be wicked. His son Amaziah is going to be worse. But Athaliah and Jehoram will also have a little girl named Jehoshabeth. And she will marry a godly man. Her and her husband are God's next move. I would love to go back and tell him that. There's going to be a little girl that comes in your line. And she's going to change everything. She's going to marry a preacher. She's going to marry the priest. And your whole story is going to change. And God's going to come in and He's going to make His next move. So just, you can die in peace knowing that God will counteract everything that Satan is going to do. 2 Chronicles 22 verse 11 says, But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that he, uh, she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Jehoiada the priest and his wife Jehoshabeth see that Athaliah is murdering her own grandchildren. They know that Ahaziah had just had a son before he died. Joash, this little boy, is one year old. She knows, yeah, but Ahaziah had a son. Let's see if we can get to him before she gets to him. And they go and they get Joash. They find this little boy and his nurse, and they take them to the temple, the one place Athaliah has no interest in. Athaliah is not going to church. <laughs> So they take Joash and his nurse, and they take him and hide him in the temple. And they hide him there in the house of God for six years. All Jehoshaphat wanted was for God to be glory, glorified through his line. That's what he wanted. Well, Jehoshaphat, here it comes. God's next move is here. Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth decided to pour their life into the slightest hint of the possibility of hope. A one-year-old little boy. They poured it all into that one little boy. They invested their life into the life of a little boy. <laughs> Do you have anything else riding on this, guys? Nope. That's him. Do you know what he's going to choose or the path he's going down? Nope. It's the slightest little spark of hope. And we're going to pour everything into that little boy. They were the influence that Jehoshaphat's line needed to see in order to get back to God. Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth. Just a little 
the priest and his wife. They go and they rescue this little boy and take him to the, the temple. Because they did not stop loving and serving God, Joash went from certain death to being God's next move. Satan doesn't plan for those things. He can't plan for those things. He can only work inside of what he can see. But then you've got God who knows the beginning from the end. He sees the whole picture. He says, do what you can. But there's a little one-year-old boy over here. <laughs> Athaliah doesn't know about him. She doesn't know where he's at. As far as she knows, the, everybody that she sent out to kill these kids did their job. But Jehoshabeth and Jehoiada pick up this little boy and tell his nurse, come with us. And they take him to the one place Athaliah is not going to check. <laughs> we're going to take him to church. <coughs> and we're going to hide him there for six years. They invested their life into the life of this little boy. In the book of Jeremiah, we see Jeremiah crying out to God because of all the wickedness that was surrounded, he was surrounded by in his day. In Jeremiah 12, 1, it says, Righteous are you, Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Have you ever been there? God, I know you're right, but we need to talk about the calls that you're making. It's not going according to my plan, God. I think this is right, and then you chose something other than what I thought would be right. So, you're righteous, Lord, but let me talk to you about your judgments. <laughs> Jeremiah's just being real here. So let me just talk to you about your judgments, Lord. It says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Why is the wickedness growing? And I'm not seeing a whole lot of good. I just want to talk to you about your, the calls that you're making, God, because it doesn't seem to be working. Jeremiah saw the wickedness rising up all around him, and he was a godly man, but it seemed like Satan was going to take the win. God, Satan's going to win this. Where, where's your judgments, God? What's going on here? I'm just questioning this. I know you're righteous, but your calls don't seem to be going according to your character. So I'm just asking questions. I need to know. So he cries out to God and asks a simple question. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are they so happy who deal treacherously? What's going on here, God? And this is a question we all may face in life. Why does evil prosper? And why does it seem like the good is just, they make a debut every once in a while, but that's it. Why, God, why do the wicked prosper? This is a question that we may all face at some point. But remember, no matter how difficult things seem to be, God will never let the story end on a negative note for those who delight in Him. It cannot happen. It will always end positively. Even though the circumstances point to all negative, remember, God's got another move. He always has the next move. Don't stop moving forward for the cause of Christ. And it does get hard sometimes. It really does. I've been depressed before. I've looked and like, I just, I just want to stop. I'm weary. I'm so tired. I'm doing all this and I'm so tired, God. And it doesn't look like anybody's listening. It doesn't look like anybody wants to follow you. I spent years of my life saying, God, it just doesn't look like there's any results. I had no idea he had a next move. I had no idea I'd be standing up here preaching to a bunch of faithful people one day. I never saw that coming. God said, just stay faithful. But I don't see it working out. I don't see it going anywhere, God. Just stay faithful. All right. You must know something I don't know. <laughs> Isn't it crazy we talk to him like that sometimes? And it's like he's God or something. He really seems to have it together and he's really good at what he does. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Don't stop. Don't grow weary in doing what's right. God's not done yet. Even though it doesn't seem like God's involved, He is not done yet. Stay faithful. Just because we see wickedness prospering does not mean that God has nothing planned. He's just setting up his next move. It's part of the setup. He is setting up his next move. The question is, are you willing to be part of the plan? 
not see the end game? Are you willing to be part of the plan? You don't have to see the success. Are you willing to stay faithful and be part of what he's doing? Because remember, we're part of something a whole lot bigger than our agenda. Are you willing to be part of the plan? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 11. This is the uh, record of God's next move for Jehoshaphat's line. This is the same story that we're reading in 2 Chronicles. This is just the continuation of that story. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 11. Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth have been hiding Joash in the temple for six years while Athaliah continue, continues to disease the nation with her belief system. God has been setting the board up to make his move. And this is the day when God makes his move. Right here. 2 Kings chapter 11, in verse 4. In the seventeenth year, Jehoiada, or yeah, in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts, and brought them into the house of the Lord to him. And he made a covenant with them, and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord, and showed them the king's son. Then he commanded them, saying, This is what ye shall do. One third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One third shall be at the gate of Sir, and one third at the gate beyond the, behind the escorts. You shall keep the watch of the house, lest it be broken down. Two con the two contingents of the of the, I'm sorry, the two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord for the king. But you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the command... Uh, I'm sorry, the priest gave the, uh, gave the captains of hundreds the spears and shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. Then the escort stood, every man with his weapon in his hand, all around the king from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple by the altar and the house. And he brought out the king's son, put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and they made him king and anointed him and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king! Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. Now she's going to church. <laughs> now she's here. When she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. So Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, Treason! Treason! And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay her with the sword, whoever follows her. For, for the priest had said, Do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. So they seized her, and she went by the way of the horse's entrance into the king's house, and there she was killed. God's next move. That's amazing. God makes his move. And his move is king takes queen. King takes queen. I didn't see that coming, God. It looked like uh, you, you look back, you got Jehoram, and he turned away from you. And Amaz Amaziah, he turned away from you, God. And it looked like nothing was happening. And it looked like there wasn't a success story. And God says, yeah, but I've got one king on the board. And my king is going to take their queen. King takes queen. God used two unlikely people to turn the whole story around. Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth chose to be the testimony for God in the lives of a little boy, and God was pleased. We cannot ever stop investing our life into the life of others. We cannot stop. If we go back to the beginning of the story, we see the tragic end of Jehoram's life. Let me read that verse for you, just to remind you of what it was. In 2 Chronicles 21 20, it says, He was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. In his death, he was not even honored as a king. 
Then we see as time moves on that God makes his move through the life of Jehoiada and his wife. And I want to show you the final chapter of this story. In 2 Chronicles 24, 15, this is the end of Jehoiada's life. It says, But Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings. Because he had done good in Israel, both towards God and his house. Wait, Jehoiada wasn't a king. He was just a preacher. He was just a priest. Now, Jehoram was a king, and they said, we're not going to honor him as a king. Jehoiada was just a priest, and they said, we are going to honor him as a king. Because he's done good for the people, and he has done good for God. Jehoiada got the honor. He allowed his life to be trusted in the hands of God to be used to set up for his next move. When we can understand that we have a role in something so much bigger than ourselves, it's easier to trust that God has it under control. When you realize it's not your agenda, it's His agenda. When you realize that we are just a little part of something so much bigger than ourselves, it's easy to trust the one in control. We don't have to alter the circumstances. We don't have to let anxiety build up because of what we're watching happen around us. We're just part of a bigger plan. And God says, I want you to invest your life into the life of other people. Why? Because it might just be a one-year-old little boy that God's going to make a next move with. It might just be that person that you're pouring a little bit of love into that God says, wait and see what I'm going to do with that person. It might just be a friend. God says, pour love into them. Why? I'm just trying to help them stand. They've had a rough life. They made bad decisions. They poured out so much into this world and accepted so much from this world. I don't see what you can do through them, God. And God says, just love them, love them, love them. Why? Because they're my next move. They're my next move. And I want you to be faithful. And I want you to love them. Pour your life into the life of other people. You never know what God's going to bring from that. Because I promise you, God is never going to let the story end on a negative note for those who delight in Him. He always has another move. And the person that you're pouring your life into just may be that move. We've got to stay faithful. We are not the end game. We are created to bring about the end game. The kingdom of God, we're part of that process right there. You love others. You lead them to the Lord. You invite them to church. You be faithful because we're not the end game. We are part of the process that leads to the end game. Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back. And we're going to see him. But who are we going to bring with us? It might have just been his next move that was walking right next to us as we approach him. When he stands in front of us and we see that person who died that unbelievably cruel death for us. And say, hey, um, here's this little boy that I poured my life into. And God then opens it up and says, I want to show you what I did with his life. See that multitude of people over here? They would have never been connected. If it wasn't for your love being poured into that life right there, God always has the next move. He's always doing something. God will win. He will win. We should be humbled to be part of something so incredible. It should be so humbling. Your testimony may be the key to breaking through to a soul that is lost. It is incredible what people will do in dire straits when they are offered a slight little bit of hope. That little bit of love may change their whole world. And if we will invest our life into the little bit of hope we see in others, our nation will reap the benefits. It is going to happen if we just stay faithful. What if the wicked are prospering? Stay faithful. What if we don't see any good coming out of it? Stay faithful. God is going to make another move. Jesus entrusted you with the potential to change the life of 7.4 billion people. Isn't that an incredible thought? He created you, and He is using you for the potential 
of changing the lives of 7.4 billion people. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't stop. Are we going to reach them all? No, but the potential is there for every single one of them to be saved. And you are created for that purpose. We are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. We get frustrated or even depressed when things don't go according to our plans, but we need to remember we are part of something so much bigger than our own plans. What would happen if we decided to be a Jehoiada? What would happen if we decided to be a Jehoshabeth? What would happen to this world if we actually made that decision where, God, I'm not the, fi I'm not the answer. I'm not the answer. But I'm going to pour my life into the life of this other person. Because that might be your next move. And it's not for me to get the credit. It's for you to get the glory. You know what? Jehoshaphat did get to see it, but he got to stand next to his Savior when he did it. Yeah, there's that next move. Oh, I didn't see that coming. God works in mysterious ways. Through the slaughter of Athaliah's grandchildren, God's going to take one king. King takes queen. One piece left on the board. Just like that right there. One king left on the board. When you invest your life into the life of another person, there will be a connection and the chain will go on. And it might take a while to see where the connection is made, but there will be a connection. I want to show you how this works. Our church has been praying for Haven Holcomb. Trevor and Amanda's little girl, a little baby that was born just the other day. We have been praying for this little girl. Dan, would you put that picture on the screen for me? This is Haven. <laughs> Look at the size of this little baby. So small. You can see Amanda's hand here right next to her daughter. Look how small she is. We have been praying for Haven. She was born a few days ago on July 13th. She weighs one pound and seven ounces. She is 11 inches long. She was born 15 weeks early. And I just got a text from Trevor right before the service started and he says, and she's doing great. She's doing great. Absolutely. She'll be in the hospital for the next 13 to 15 weeks to be monitored and cared for. And there will be a lot of ups and downs, so please continue to keep them in your prayers. But through this time, a connection was being made that I did not see coming. And you're going to have to give me a minute while I share this with you. As I tell you about the connection, I don't intend to give any glory to anyone except God. So let's make sure He gets it. I just find it amazing how he makes the connections. Six years ago, on July 14th, our daughter Kendall was born. And she was immediately taken to the NICU to be monitored because her body was so fragile. On September 30th of the same year, Kendall went to be with the Lord. Now, that's not the focal point of this story, okay? This goes to him. Many years before this event, my wife and I found out that we could not have children. And for 10 years, our marriage, in our marriage, we waited for our daughter Caroline to be born. We thought we couldn't have kids. For a decade, we just thought we couldn't have kids. And then God went ahead and changed the diagnosis because now he's God. And now we have three. You'll be run over by one of them today. <laughs> But we waited for 10 years, and we thought we couldn't have children. During those 10 years, we poured our lives into the life of teenagers. That's what we decided to do. If we can't have our kids, if we can't have children of our own, then we're going to love other people's children, and we're going to guide them the best we can so he still gets glory from our lives. Shanna Holcomb, our nursery coordinator, was one of those teenagers. Shana, I'm crying with you right now. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm on camera, so I got to hold it together here. <laughs> Shanna was one of those teenagers. 
After Shanna left the youth group, life happened and the distance was created, which just happens in life. The teenagers move on and maybe you will see them again, maybe you won't. But a distance was created. Many years later, through the grapevine, Shanna found out that we had started Renew Church on May 22nd of last year. Remarkably enough, God used the loss of our daughter to begin moving our hearts towards starting Renew. God's love was all over Kendall's story. In February, Shannon encouraged her family to come to Renew, where many of them got saved and were baptized. Watch God move. Just watch Him move. He always has another move. And that family has been faithful. And you are a blessing to our church. Trevor and Amanda are watching right now on Facebook. You are a blessing to our church. Two days ago on July 14th, Kendall's sixth birthday, my wife and I were able to meet Haven, God's little miracle. On Kendall's birthday, we got to go in into the NIC unit and stand over Haven and look at a little girl who has a struggle ahead of her, but I believe with all my heart will be a success story. And Trevor and Amanda told us that they have the strength to move forward through this, through this storm that they're going through, because of the connection God made with our two stories. Renew our faithfulness to serve God must not grow weary. Don't grow weary in well-doing because you will reap if you don't lose heart. God has another move and He's going to make another move. People need to see our faithfulness and our love for Christ. We cannot allow life to get in the way. When we allow our agenda to move to the front, we forget that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. God will make the connection. And even like our story, that was a storm that we didn't come out on the positive end of. But I'm telling you, we did nothing but win because God moved through our whole situation and that little girl right there, God continued to make connections and we get to be part of her life. And people are going to heaven because a teenager we talked to years ago poured her life into the life of other people. And that family continues to pour life and love into the life of other people. And God continues to grow this church. God will never let the story end on a negative note for those who delight in Him. God has a next move. You may be that next move or the love that you pour into somebody else's life, that life just may be his next move. Stay faithful. Stand with me, please.